I'm going to invite you up. At this time, we want to dismiss the Sunday school children. We have a special guest speaker this morning. Actually, my, word, my name was on the bulletin, but uh, it happened to be that Denise Dickens comes over. She's visiting us. And I asked her if she would have a word this morning or a few minutes to share. She said, yes, sure, no problem. I think I actually have a message. Oh, go for it. So you might wonder, who is Denise Dickens? Well, for a lot of us, we know, but for some of you, uh, let me just quickly tell you. Denise Dickens, Bobby Dickens were missionaries in Boom Creek, Blue Creek, and PG. Uh, Bobby and Denise, they were in Boom Creek, and Hurricane Mitch came, and uh, they went for uh, relief to Honduras. I met Bobby for the first time in the soldier camp in Honduras. They were about going to bed when I came in. They didn't have room for me in the, in the army camp, so I went to the hotel with somebody else together. But that's where I met Bobby Dickens for the first time. And uh, it was interesting. He was sharing the Bible. He was just overflowing. He was happy. He was joyous. I saw that he had something I wanted to have. And I wondered what that was. Now I know. Back then I didn't know what it was. It was the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He was flowing. And so uh, we, Frank actually invited them over to Spanish account. We started a Bible study in Frank and Mary's front porch. And we have many good memories. That's where Found the Life got started. Later we moved to Plateau Builders. And Bobby would read the Bible and I would ask him, what, how come I just understand your Bible so good? What? What is different about it? What's the translation? He said, it's the New Living Translation. So you might know why I'm always like that New Living Translation. And uh, so we do have many good memories from the beginning. We had a lot of miracles happen when we prayed, and, and uh, Denise would always be the worship leader. She's very good in worshiping. And uh, we would have prayer nights when... Uh, the prayer night hit at their house. He, I remember he had a sticker in the door, come inside and pray. And when, he, when we came inside, he was on his knees praying. He did not ask you to come in. He said, come in and pray. There was no gossiping. There was no talking. There was, it was prayer time. And I love that. It was, it was good. He meant it. So, uh, yes, there's so many memories we could share about what has happened back then. But anyways, Bobby went to be with the Lord a few years ago, but Denise, she's still here with us. She came and visited us. So uh, come up, Denise, give her a hand. Let's see what the Lord has for us this morning. And of course, she's been doing translation, a Bible translation for some new tribe, she can tell, talk about that if that's what she has on her heart. But God bless you. Time is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Harvey. Thanks, everybody. Oh. Okay, y'all. My heart is right here, and my tears are right here. So if I get choked up, you'll understand. It's partly missing Bobby, but mostly just the joy of being here again with you. It's such a blessing and an honor. The last time we were here was seven years ago, and Bobby was preaching from this pulpit. And so to have the honor of sharing with you from the same pulpit, it's like, I don't know, something redemptive in that. Like God is just fixing something. And I believe he wants to fix that something in each of our lives. He has a good plan and a good purpose for each one of us. 
And we don't understand why we go through the things we go through. Man, it's hard. Sometimes it's so hard and we wonder, why, what? What have I done? <laughs> but in the midst of it all, just like we did this morning with this amazing worship group, we can worship God and know that he is good. Amen? He is good. Amen? He is good. Amen? Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you how good you are to us. Thank you for your goodness to us right here, right now. And we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Well, Harvey mentioned that I am continuing in ministry. I, I lived for a while in Florida with Bobby. He passed away in 2018 from cancer. And after he died, I sold my house there and moved to Ohio to be with my mom. And you may remember my daughter, Alicia. She moved with me at the same time. My older daughter, Elizabeth, was already in Ohio with, in my mom's town. She's married, has two daughters, so I have two granddaughters. And later on, my son, Caleb, also moved from Florida to Ohio. So all of my kids are in Ohio. My mom is in Ohio. And for a while, I felt like, you know, what am I supposed to do? Just be here. I felt, I felt like God wasn't finished with me yet. When, when Bobby and I were in ministry together, he and I would build each other up. You know, we would encourage one another in the Lord. It wasn't like I just depended on him to do all of the ministry or he depended on me to do all of the ministry. We ministered together. And I want to encourage each one of you. You have a, a, that special someone, whether it's a husband or a wife or someone else in your life, you have that special someone that God has enabled you to minister alongside of. Encourage one another in your faith. Because you don't know how long that other person is going to be there. And we can't depend always upon that person. We have to put our faith in God. Amen? And as we take the opportunity that we have on this earth to encourage one another and build each other up, the Lord's going to use that. He's going to plant seeds in your heart and in that other person's heart and in all the people's hearts around you. And he's going to create that body of Christ that can never pass away. Never pass away. Because Jesus is the resurrection. He is the life. And those whom we love who have passed on before, they're still part of the body of Christ. They're still cheering us on. Rejoicing at what God is doing with us here, now. I'm so thankful for that. So thankful. Well, like Harvey said, I am continuing in ministry. The Lord led me to join Pioneer Bible Translators. And I've been a teacher, um, you know, most of my life. And yet I always had a desire to be involved in Bible translation. I didn't know that teaching, reading is part of Bible translation. I'm a reading teacher. God knew. God knew. He knows my desire. He knows my ability. He knows your desire. He knows your abilities. He has the exact plan for each of us. I joined a team. I thought I was going to go to Africa or somewhere across the world, but there is a team in Kentucky, which is not very far from Ohio, right? And I am able to be in Kentucky working with some African people. There is war in their homeland. They had to run for their lives. Some of them ended up in Kentucky, and they needed a Bible, and God provided a group of people to work with them, to help them to have a Bible, to help their people learn how to read it in their language. And God has put me right there with them, not very far from my grandchildren. And I'm very, very grateful that he's not done with me yet. He's not done with any of us yet. He has a plan. He has a good plan. He has a good purpose. And I want to encourage you in that. 
So, when Harvey asked me if I would share, I'm like, sure, this is, this is a good opportunity. I enjoy sharing God's word. And this morning, as I was praying, the Lord just downloaded a message. And so I asked Harvey, how long do you want me to share? <laughs> and he said, oh, well, you can have the whole, the whole message if you want it. Good, yes, that's what I wanted. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. I appreciate the opportunity. So I would like to share with you something that I have been looking at in my daily devotions. If you're not already reading God's Word every day, it's a really, really good thing to do. Even if you just spend 15 minutes a day in prayer and Bible reading, it will make an eternal difference in your life. Amen. So I would like to read with you from Job. That's where I was reading recently. Job chapter 1. If you have it in your Bible, you can turn there. I happen to have the Message Bible, which is kind of like the Living Bible. Um, it's not the Bible that I use all the time, but it's the one that I have with me, and so I'm going to read from that. You know, I mentioned that there are things that happen and we just don't understand. And we may never understand until we get to heaven and have the full picture. But Job chapter 1 into chapter 2 gives us a glimpse, a little picture of what goes on in the heavenly realms. So let's read in Job chapter 1. Job and you may have heard of him, he was a man who lived in Uz. He was honest inside and out, a man of his word who was totally devoted to God and hated evil with a passion. To me, that describes a lot of people in Spanish Lookout, people who love God with their whole heart. And no, nobody's perfect. But when we love God with our whole heart, like David loved God with his whole heart, God doesn't see the imperfections. He sees the passion that we have for him. Job had seven sons and three daughters. He was also very wealthy. 7,000 head of sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen. So that's, you know, team is two. 500 donkeys, and a huge staff of servants, the most influential man in all the East. His sons used to take turns hosting parties in their homes, always inviting their three sisters to join them in their merrymaking. When the parties were over, Job would get up early in the morning and sacrifice a burnt offering for each of his children, thinking, maybe one of them sinned? by defying God inwardly. Maybe he had a little bit of fear that his kids would do something wrong. Do you think God held that against him? No, you're going to see what God says about him. Job made a habit of this sacrificial atonement just in case they had sinned. One day, when the angels came to report to God, Satan who was the accuser, came along with them. God singled out Satan and said, What have you been up to? Satan answered God, Going here and there, checking things out on the earth. God said to Satan, Have you noticed my friend Job? There's no one quite like him, honest and true to his word, totally devoted to God and hating evil. See, that's how God described Job. That's how God looked at Job. In spite of his little fear, in spite of his mistakes, God saw him as totally devoted to him. That's how God sees us in Jesus. Well, Satan wasn't satisfied with that answer. He said, so do you think Job does all that out of sheer goodness of his heart? Why, no one ever had it so good. You pamper him like a pet 
making sure nothing bad ever happens to him or his family or his possessions. You bless everything he, he does. He can't lose. But what do you think would happen if you reached down and took away everything that is his? He'd curse you right to your face. That's what. God replied, we'll see. Go ahead. Do what you want with all that is his. Just don't hurt him. Then Satan left the presence of God. So we have a little picture of a conversation going on in heaven. Who is the accuser? Satan. Satan is the accuser. He was pushing God to touch Job. But let's see. What did God say to Satan? Did God say, okay, I will do that. No, he said, you do what you want. He kind of lifted back the protection that was over Job and said, all right, I'll let you have your way to a limit. So you probably know the story. If you don't know the story, I encourage you to go through and read the book of Job. There were bands of thieves that came and took all of his animals and a big tornado came and blew down the house where all of his children were gathered for a party and all of his children died. Can you imagine the suffering that Job felt at that time, wondering what has happened? Why did this happen? And how many times do we ask ourselves that question? Why did this happen? I don't understand it. It's okay to call out to God like that. But we have to remember the thing that, that Job did and didn't do. Do you have the last verse of the chapter there? In the very last verse... Nope, not that one. In the very last verse of chapter 1, it says... Not once through all this did Job sin. Not once did he blame God. And as I've spent time in this community, I've noticed that that's a strength, that I don't hear a lot of blaming God. In my culture, people tend to blame God. They say, God, why did you do this to me? But we see from chapter 1, it wasn't God doing it to him. He held back the cover for a short time, and he allowed Satan to attack Job. And we know in chapter 2 that Satan came back into the presence of God, and God was saying, see, there's my servant Job. He didn't even blame me. He didn't even sin. He didn't curse me like you said he would. And Satan said, yeah, but touch his body and he'll be sure to curse you to your face. And God said, okay, but you can't kill him. So again, that protection was covered a little bit, was, was lifted a little bit. So that's when Job got covered with boils, painful sores all over his body from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And he sat in an ash heap and was scraping his sores with whatever he could find. And people were cursing him, and they were ridiculing him. They were laughing at him. Ha! Look at you. You thought you were something special. Look at you now. Yet, the same thing. Not once through all this did Job sin. He said nothing against God. Even though his wife did, his wife cursed God. He's like, stop talking foolishness. Can we accept only good from God and not bad? We have to keep praising God. We have to keep worshiping God. Like our sister said, you know, even when something bad happens to our children, we have to keep praising God. We have to keep worshiping. We have to keep recognizing that he is Lord. He is God. He is good. He has his plan. He has his purpose. We can trust him. We can trust him. Now, yeah, hallelujah. We can trust him in everything. 
There are a lot of chapters after this that can be a little bit hard to understand if you haven't read the last part of Job yet. Let me just tell you about those chapters. He had three friends who came and sat with him in the ash heap. And for seven days, they were quiet. They were just, oh, their hearts were hurting for Job. They were quiet and, and respectful. And then it's like they just couldn't stand it any longer. They heard Job complaining, oh, my sores, my sores, oh, my family, my family, oh, this, oh, that. And they finally had it up to here, and they said, oh, can't you just see? Can't, can't you see it? You deserved all this. You must have done something bad. You must have done something wrong to deserve all this, Job. That sounds like the voice of an accuser. Who was the accuser? Who did we see in chapter 1 was the accuser? Satan is the accuser. And here were his so-called friends bringing all these religious arguments, things that they had been taught, not things that they had experienced firsthand from God, but things that they had been taught and passed down and, and, thing, and things that they thought they understood, accusing Job of doing something terrible, so he must have deserved all this. And he kept saying, no, I didn't do anything wrong. Now, as you look at what Job was saying in all these chapters, he was kind of depending on his own integrity, his own righteousness, his own goodness. So Job had a little bit of learning to do in the process, too. And this goes on for many chapters, but as you read, and I encourage you to read Job, as you read through those, just keep in mind what happens toward the end. In chapter 38, God speaks up. God shows up on the scene and speaks out of a storm and talks to Job and tells him, hey, you know, you think you know me? You think you know who I am? Have you ever seen this or this or this or this or this? And he goes on and tells all kinds of powerful things that he is doing in the earth. And then he confronts Job directly in chapter 40. And he says, Job, you've been talking out of ignorance too. Enough of this. So Job answers and says, I am convinced God, you can do anything and everything. I, 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 don't, I haven't known what I was talking about. In chapter 42, Job says, you know, I once lived by rumors of you. And isn't that what we do many times in our lives? When we haven't yet had that encounter with the living God. When we haven't learned from firsthand experience who he is and how good he is. We just go by those rumors. We go by what we've been taught as kids. We go by with what people are telling us and telling us and telling us. But once God shows up, it changes everything. Amen? God changes everything when he is on the scene. And I can say from my experience... Losing my husband was one of the hardest things that I ever went through. It's like, what do I do? What, what do I do? He was my ministry partner. He was my life partner. You probably felt the same with somebody that you've lost. And yet, in that pain, I remember days when I would just fall on my face and worship God. And his presence was so close. It's like he was just wrapping me in his arms and showing me who he is and how much he loves us. No matter what pain we're going through, he loves us. And he will never leave us. He will never forsake us, no matter what. No matter what. So Job said, you know, I admit, I once lived 
by rumors of you, but now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. And he repented. He said, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry that I had my eyes focused on me. I'll keep my eyes focused on you now. Chapter 42 goes on and <laughs> says that after God finished talking to Job, he turned to Job's friends that had told him all those religious things, and he rebuked them soundly. He said, you guys had no idea what you were talking about. Job was right. And I want Job to pray for you so that my anger will not break out against you. Do you think Job wanted to pray for them? He was probably kind of mad at them for all the torment that they put him through when he was being tormented in his body. They were adding torment to his mind and his soul. God told Job to pray for those friends, and he did. Job prayed for his friends, and you can show the next verse. Okay, the last part that says God accepted Job's prayer. And after Job had interceded for his friends, notice that? Job prayed for his friends. He said, God, probably like Jesus on the cross, God forgive them. They, they really didn't know what they were doing. How could they? Had they ever had an encounter with God before? And think about all the people in our lives who may have hurt us. I think God's calling us to pray for them. Maybe in the same way. God, forgive them. They really don't know what they're doing. God, bless their lives. Give them an encounter with you. Lord, fill my heart with your love and your compassion for these people. <laughs> After Job had interceded for his friends, God restored his fortune. Yeah. And then he doubled it. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Wow, everybody came and celebrated with him. God doubled. God gave Job double for his trouble. I've heard that a lot. Double for his trouble. But it came after he interceded for his friends. It came after he prayed for them and blessed them and asked God to have mercy on them. Then God restored Job's fortune and doubled it. It says that, that God blessed Job's later life even more than his earlier life. He ended up with 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. <laughs> That's a lot of animals, isn't it? <laughs> and he also had seven sons and three daughters. And somebody pointed that out one time. He's like, wait a minute, that's not double. He had seven sons and three daughters before. And he got seven sons and three daughters again. And they said, oh, but wait. The seven sons and three daughters, they were still alive. They're in heaven waiting for Job. So they, he does have double, double the amount of children. Amen? Amen. When we lose our loved ones, they're not lost if they're in Christ. Isn't that good news? It is such good news. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, thank God. Thank God for the resurrection. Glory. So Job lived on another 140 years, living to see his children and grandchildren, four generations, and he died an old man and full of life. Yeah, we can learn a lot from the story of Job. There's a... Uh, another personal piece to that. Um, you know, where in the beginning where it said that Satan asked permission to touch Job's life, it reminds me of somewhere in Luke, I can't remember the exact verse, where it says that, where, Peter, where Jesus says to Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. 
But when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. I remember a time, I don't remember what was going on exactly, but it was a challenge. We were, we were, I think we were new to Spanish Lookout, still learning the culture, still learning how to, how to manage ministry in this part of the world. And I can't remember if I was awake or asleep, but I remember the voice of God speaking to my heart saying, Denise, Denise, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. I feel like I've been sifted. <laughs> I feel like I've been sifted. I feel like I've gone through that place of darkness of not understanding why, not understanding how to go on, not understanding what was happening. And I can't say it's just one time of going through dark places. I think the Lord takes us through cycles. He allows cycles in our lives where, you know, we get glimpses of him and it's so good. And then, and then it's like, where am I again? What's going on? Have you experienced that? Yeah. But as we come through each time, if we will put ourselves in a place of worship, God, and I love that worship this morning. This is a good place of worship. But don't just wait for Sunday morning. Worship him in your home. Worship him in your work. Worship him. Honor him. Seek him. Oh, you're going to find him. And as we find him in each of these cycles, he reveals more and more of us. And we are equipped to strengthen one another, to strengthen that life partner that we're with, to strengthen that ministry partner that we're with, to build each other up in our most holy faith. Do you agree with that? Amen. Amen. I don't even know how long I was supposed to preach, <laughs> but I'm pretty much finished. Is that all right? Okay, I want to leave you with Romans 15, verse 13. Oh, may the God of green hope fill you up with joy, fill you up with peace, so that believing Lives filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit will brim over with hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory, glory, glory. Lord, we love you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We honor you. We want to know you like never before. May you be glorified in our lives. And may you equip us, Father God, to strengthen one another for your kingdom's sake and your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise. Great message. Okay, you got an early lunch today. God bless you, and you're dismissed.